All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining um, our Socratic seminar number 16. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Clark Moody. He is the famous, famous creator of the Clark Moody Bitcoin dashboard, which um, I personally love and I use and reference a lot. But um, before we get started with that, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, River Financial. They are the best Bitcoin brokerage in the space. And um, they also have Lightning Network support. So if you are looking for a place to buy Bitcoin and set um, the, the cheapest recurring orders, um, look for River Financial at river.com. Cool. All right. Well, Clark, um, why don't you kind of uh, introduce yourself? It'd be cool to hear a little bit about your Bitcoin background a little bit. And then, um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about your Bitcoin dashboard. Awesome. It's good to be here. Bitcoin background. Uh, so I was in grad school, aerospace engineering, and my lab mate was running Bitcoin on one of the lab machines, and it was pegging the processor. And I looked at the task manager, and I was like, what is this Bitcoin thing? And he said, don't worry about it. And I said, okay, Google, go to Google, found Bitcoin.org, read the white paper, um, went down the rabbit hole, and... Uh, I was at the time I was kind of interested in automated trading, and so I discovered that Mt. Gox had real-time market data for free. And of course, any other real-time market data is going to cost you a pretty penny, you know, big Nasdaq hookup and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, this is cool. Basically, taught myself how to build web apps and uh, launched my first Bitcoin market data website in June of 2011. Doing the Mt. Gox uh, order book, Mt. Gox time and sales, and then like charting. And that evolved into a uh, desktop trading interface that was acquired by Blockchain in 2014. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I worked with Blockchain um, and uh, worked with them for a while. Uh, did, a little, did a little stint at Bitcoin.com and then. Ooh, to do a no, startup. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this this is uh let's see 2015 2016. Oh okay, down. okay. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, did a startup with Dan Held and our CEO Matt Galgan, and uh, uh, that startup was acquired by Kraken in uh, last uh, last July. So a couple acquisitions in the space. The startup was doing uh, back office accounting stuff. But kind of like across all of your exchanges, all of your blockchains, everything for these institutional players. Um, that's acquired by Kraken, so I'm working at Kraken now, building CryptoWatch. Uh, go download CryptoWatch desktop if you haven't. Laden fast, written in Rust. It's awesome. Dang. Uh, yeah, and so the dashboard, uh, let's see. The dashboard was kind of like a, the goal was like, I want to see everything on one page. The entire Bitcoin economy, one page, blinking lights, flashing. Um, if you remember during the four cores, you're going to like five different websites to see what the block sizes are, what the fees are, how the miners are signaling for SegWit, um, the UASF node counts, stuff like that. And uh, instead of going to a bunch of different websites, and you're looking at one or two numbers on each site, why not just pull all the numbers into one screen and you can have it all right there. So that was the goal for the dashboard. And I don't know exactly when, um, I don't know exactly when I launched it, but uh, you could probably go find that on Twitter. But I've slowly been adding to it over time. And uh, we could do a quick, we could do like a really fast overview of just what's on it. I'm sharing my screen. You should be able to see it. So, yep. uh, right at the top price. Some people say price is not important, but most people care about the price a lot. So that's why it's number one. And then I try to group, group similar things in these little modules. Um, I love how you have so, sats per dollar. Yeah. Sats per dollar. That's for uh, that's for Matt O'Dell. Um, <laughs> the market cap right here, and so then I have an ad. I'm running an ad here. So once, hopefully, this is the most tasteful ad on the internet. 
And then, uh, so market overview, exchange traded products. This is like GBTC is gone. It used to be here. Everybody's like, I want to see the GBTC premium. Soon, someday it will come back. Anyway, QBTC is a similar product on Canadian exchanges. And then here, this is fun. Uh, commodity markets, Bitcoin price and gold, 9.6 ounces right now. So this is coming from FTX, uh, FTX markets, and they have a they have a, an oil contract, but it like dies sometimes, so that's why it's zero barrels. Anyway, then you get the blockchain blockchain statistics. Did we, let me see. There's a chat, right? Yep. Uh, off return data. Okay, I'll be sure to hit that on our way on our way down. Yeah. So the blockchain, you know, where are we block height, money supply? This is actually a little bit high because I'm not doing. I, I, I've got to rerun the numbers, as it were. Uh oh. Um, it's, it's high by about 110 coins. <laughs> Rescanning the chain takes a long time. Uh, it's close enough, uh, for now. It will get better. What percentage are we at? 88.3%. So people say, oh, Bitcoin's going to take till 2100 to all be issued, but we're almost at 90%. I mean, we're almost all, almost all the way there at this point. Um, UTXO set size, a, a UTXO is an unspent Bitcoin. Uh, so that's kind of a, you could think of that as a uh, upper bound on the number of individual holders that could possibly be self-custodying their own Bitcoin. Um, so ex explain that. So you're, you're, you're making an assumption that every transaction is one person, right? Every unspin. So if, if every person using Bitcoin held one output, in their own wallet, the maximum number of people that could be is 68.1 million at this time. There you go. If they if they were self-custodying Bitcoin. Now we all know that hopefully a lot more than that uh, have Bitcoin on some sort of other service, but also it, each wallet holds a bunch of UTXOs. So you could have a thousand UTXOs and so you would skew it that way. So I don't know, maybe give or take those two numbers and this could be some Close to the number of Bitcoin holders, it's probably higher. Block time, how how long have blocks been taking to come out? They're supposed to come out every 10 minutes and the system adjusts. Chain size is how much it takes up on disk and then op return data. So uh, one of our chat members asked about op return data. So you can, you can add an output to a transaction that just puts data in the blockchain. And you can use that to like anchor an open timestamp or something similar or your engagement announcement or something like that. People like to do that. Um, and so this is just, a, if you sum up all of that data on the whole chain, it's at two and a half gigs right now. And so you could argue that's just chain bloat. The block, you know, you're abusing the blockchain if you do that, but you could also argue you paid fees to get it in and a miner included it, so it's valid. But I'm just reporting how much, uh, how much size there's, how much size that takes up on disk. Or uh, that's the, the data size in the chain. Next to block time, it says uh, prior year. What does that mean? Take the timestamp now, the timestamp one year ago, count the number of blocks, divide by the time, or divide time divided by blocks, and you get an average of nine minutes. Running, running average of the past years. Nine minutes, 55 on. seconds. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So we're still coming a little bit faster over the last year, but not by much. The network's doing a pretty good job of, of keeping us but the, the difficulty adjustments doing a good job of keeping us on track. Bitcoin network. So this, these are stats taken from bitnodes.io, uh, uh, 21 co, Coinbase bought those guys. So this is just an API that I'm pumping through. I'm not running a node scanner and these numbers are really, really low compared to what the truth is. So let me go quick over that. Lightning network. How much Bitcoin's tied up in lightning network? What's it worth? How many nodes, how many channels? And again, this is public capacity, so this doesn't count private channels. I am running a Lightning node to get this information. That's pretty helpful. Bitfinex published their node stats a while back, so I put this little module in. I thought that was interesting. So I have a question. Um, yep. How are you measuring how are you measuring total capacity with your Lightning node? If you call the Lightning node and say describe graph it sends you a list of every node and every channel in this giant gRPC response. And so the nodes, it, it tells you the capacity of the, uh, on the channels, it tells you the capacity of the channel. 
and so you can sum them up. Is that true? Is it true that it um, contains a list of all the public channels? Because I thought it was limited in some way. I thought it was almost impossible to have a complete graph of the whole Lightning Network, all the in, yeah, of the whole Lightning Network from the public side. It's a list of all of the channels that my node knows about. Yeah, there you go. And if you look at something like 1ML, their numbers are pretty close to this. So it depends on how your node is syncing up, but it, everybody kind of sees the same total capacity number and around you know, 36,000 channels. Uh, liquid, I ran a liquid node to get figure out what's going on over there. 2,600 Bitcoin is in liquid right now. Over a million blocks, 7.3 gigs. Not tons of activity on Liquid, um, but you could imagine making like an equivalent dashboard for the Liquid network, Liquid sidechain too. Like you could have a dozen modules for Liquid as well. Uh, and same thing with Lightning. You could have a four, four or five, six modules for Lightning. Um, transaction counts, you know, uh, chain security. This is really important. So the hash rate, the chain work is the amount of total out of 256 total bits, how far have we gotten? And so when you go from one bit count to the next, that's double the work. So we're at 92.5. So going from 92 bits to 93 bits is doubling the chain work prior to that, um, which is completely incredible. Chain rewrite, if you took the current hash rate and tried to rewrite the chain from Genesis, this is how long it would take, 612 days. That number's been climbing, which is pretty good. Wow. Annual mining revenue, that's kind of the security spend, $4.6 billion. There you go. Sorry, just a quick question about the chain work. How do you get half a bit? This is sort of an average, or? Uh, chain work is actually just reported by the, Bit the, the Bitcoin node. Um, but you could imagine, so if, if four is two to the second power and eight is two to the third power, then two to the, uh, you know, 2.5 power is some number between four and eight. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, you could just think of it that way. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. All right. Uh, stuff about mining. Uh, the, the things I'm interested in for mining are um, kind of this block time over the recent time horizon, so 9 minutes, 26 seconds. Recently, the last difficulty change was 4.8, and then the retarget is looking at 8.8, .8 because during this epoch, well, we're just we're just now into it. We, we didn't, we're only a few blocks in, but uh, maybe 500 blocks in, but uh, blocks are coming at 9 minutes, 12 right now. So it's estimated an 8% difficulty adjustment to try to get that back to, to 10 minutes, November 29th. And then mining economics, I was really happy to get this mining economics module in here because it's got this daily P hash per second value. So this is like what you can expect to make as a miner per petahash of hash power that you deploy to the network for one day. So you run a petahash per second for a day, you can expect to make $132.50. So this is like a real kind of health of miners can just really quickly look and see, would it be profitable to turn on my, to turn on my uh, hash power right now? I actually really like that because I think, um, you know, people talk about like, how much does it cost to actually mine Bitcoin? But this gives like a set cost that you can kind of, look at and then now from here you have to work backwards and look at um yeah electricity costs and and, and um yeah i don't know um, hosting a node or whatever other mining costs and factor that in so that's actually pretty helpful i've never seen that before and i i love this number because it it incorporates the the total subsidy and fees ah in their dollar value at the at the time the block was at the time the previous blocks were computed uh, found so this is um, expected so I, I I don't know what my look back is on this actually um, 
but it takes, yeah, a peta hash versus the total current hash rate and then those subsidy amounts and block uh, uh, fee amounts as well, transaction fee amounts. So it, it combines all of those things together, which is pretty cool. Then fees versus reward. This one is the number to watch in the future as the subsidy dwindles. Mm. Hopefully this number ramps up so that we have more reward uh, fees taking over uh, the total reward. When the fees equal the reward, sorry, when the fees equal the subsidy, like if we had 6.25 Bitcoin fees, then this number would read 50%. Got it. So that's a way to remember. Eventually it'll go to 100 because there will be no more subsidy. And this is another FTX. FTX has their hash rate contract. So I looked at the farthest hash rate contract that FTX has and worked back to today and how much growth rate would you have to have per year to hit that price. So it's an implied difficulty growth. And this is really really gone up recently, the price rise. Uh, halvings, the big economic heartbeat of Bitcoin. How long until the next halving in 2024, spring? It's, we're probably going to be spring 24. You know, something crazy would have to happen for it not to be then. Um, the mempool, what's going on with the transactions in the mempool right now? And then predicted next block. Um, wow, there must be a huge transaction in the mempool that's got a lot of fees because only 180 transactions in the next block. Interesting. Um, and then again, this fees versus reward. So how profitable is it to turn on those miners? We're looking at transaction fees in the next module. So, you know, a lot of people complain about fees, but there are multiple ways to think about it, right? One is if you average over the last 2016 blocks, what's the average fee rate in size? What's the average fee percentage versus the output volume? And then what's the average fee value in terms of dollars? So percentage wise, it's really low compared to something, some you know, payment processor. Uh, dollars in average terms, it seems high, but again, we're, we're putting billions and billions of dollars a day through this, this network. So, you know, try to provide a little nuance here. Uh, fee estimates, if you want to get in the next block, you know, if you want to wait, you can look at the fee estimates module. Uh, then Samurai Whirlpool. So this one was really fun. I scanned the blockchain and looked for the telltale transactions that Samurai Whirlpool creates. And uh, it's a two stage. You make a TX zero to get into the Whirlpool and then there are mix cycles and those transactions are distinct. And so you can actually tell how much value is going into the whirlpool and then how many cycles are, are or how much value is going in, how much value is coming out and how many cycles they're running. And so uh, they've spent, you know, so, so if you just look right here, there's been a balance net outflow, uh, 712 Bitcoins in, 808 out in the last 30 days, over almost 10,000 cycles, which is incredible. And then uh, 1,500 Bitcoin in there. So more Bitcoin is in the Samurai Whirlpool liquidity pool than it is in the Lightning Network, uh, public network. Think about that. Hmm. Um, economics, this is one of the first modules I put in with these monetary inflation uh, fields. So we're at 1.8% projected for the next year, which is very low inflation. Um, velocity of money is total output divided by total supply in a year. So we're turning over the money supply 27 times a year right now, which is uh, pretty good, pretty high. $36 billion a day going through the network. Stock to flow, uh, right now we've got 37 stock to flow and the forward is looking at 56. And I think gold is at 60 or 65 or something. And I've got a stock to flow price calculator in there that's saying $25,000 is the current uh, stock to flow price. Um, output type usage are these next two modules. So this is how, how people are actually sending two different output types. The first one's based on um, quantity. The next one's based on just raw numbers because these are much rarer. So someone was talking about sending taproot, uh, taproot, sending two taproot addresses on the mailing list. And then I see that there's these three SegWit unknown version uh, outputs in the last 90 days. And I think that's, that's what those transactions were. So it's pretty cool to see those showing up here. Future supply, this is look forward looking. 
we get to 90% in a little over a year, 95% in five years, 99% uh, 15 years. So then it go, you know, the last, it takes a uh, hundred years to get the last 1% of the Bitcoin supply out there. Mm. But you never really think about that, right? And then like the last full Bitcoin date is when you're, when you're at, you know, 21 million minus one is still, you know, 34 years before the final Satoshi goes out. So it takes 34 years to get the last one coin um, out there. So there's a really long, long, long tail of very small block subsidy in the future. Having versus block time. This one gets more relevant closer to the having. Like, when should we actually throw the party, you know? But uh, <laughs> I project forward from, like, the current block. If you if you multiply it by the time, average time, you get this big spread of dates. So the network, like, really put on a lot of hash power, a lot of hash power for the next, you know, four years. It could be as early as January, but then if hash power dropped a lot, it could be as late as September. So kind of some range. And then uh, this is also from the BitNodes API, just the, the, the user agent versions. A lot of people have upgraded to the latest one. So 35% of the nodes that they see for BitNodes API are at 4.20.1. Woo, okay. Um, so that's kind of an overview of like what the dashboard's showing. Maybe for the maybe for the technical users, I could describe like just to really the, kind of the, some of the challenges that I faced putting this together. So I'd really like uh, if you see the status thing, you could see all these different data sources. So I really wanted it to be able to be able to add and remove data sources without like bringing down the whole site and bringing back the whole bringing it back up. So all the module definitions come through when you load the page. They don't, they, they come over the API. They don't come pre-baked with the page. And so those are like fully dynamic that the server sends every time. So you could be just have the dashboard open and then like a new module shows up and you didn't, you didn't have to reload your page or anything. Wow. Uh, which, uh, which was one of my goals. Another thing you'll see is, so I have a lot of these producers that are all like pumping data into like a centralized consumer and then that pumps it out to the, to the clients. Another thing you'll see is all the flashing. Uh, when the price ticks around, oh, 18,000 on the nose right now, nice. Um, when the price ticks around, you'll notice multiple fields change, and those are all kind of dollar value fields. They all change with that price. And so what I did was I created a, a dependency graph between all these data points so that you know, market cap depends on supply and price, right? So if supply changes, market cap will also change. And if price changes, market cap will also change. So you make a graph of these dependencies, and then when one value changes, you push it through the whole graph to update all the fields that need to be updated, and then only send those updates to the front end. I love so that. It's only sending the fields that change. That's super efficient. Yeah. And that was a that was a fun little bit of, you know, some kind of nerd comp sci graph graph analysis kind of stuff that, that made that happen. Um, yeah, so you could imagine you know having this big chain of like, well, if maybe something depends on the like if you if you wanted to do a you know a Bitcoin dominance type thing. Well that's like you get the whole crypto, you know, market cap. That's one number in like the Bitcoin market cap and you divide those two. So now that number depends on these two other market caps and on the price and on the supply. So it's like this, this chain of dependency, uh, which I thought was pretty fun to put together. Um, yeah, I don't know. Any other, any other questions on maybe technical questions on this? Where are you? Yeah, I was kind of curious. So, uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, where are you getting the Bitcoin prices? Oh, I, I guess I didn't know who's talking. And where are you getting the Bitcoin price from? So I'm running a I'm running a site um, called uh, Tickers, and these are this is a ticking real time bunch of different markets, and these are all the indexes that uh, 
the futures that the, the derivatives markets use. use. So there's a BitMEX, in, BitMEX index, an OKCoin index, and a Deribit index. And they settle their futures contracts against those indexes. And I basically take an average of the, like a running average of those indexes and pump it out as, um, pump it out as, a, as an index price. So Why it's did kind you... of like a composite of multiple indexes to get my price. Why did you choose an index as opposed to an exchange? Um, an index is, is composed of multiple exchange feeds. And so if one exchange is like really diverging, it can pull the index, but some indexes throw out outliers. So it, it just it just filters kind of this one exchange going down, one exchange having a big you know liquidity move, and the other ones don't. Um, so that's why. Got it. So you're maybe looking at 10, 10 different exchanges are contributing to the one to the one price that I'm quoting. Are those weighted at all by volume? Can you, I guess? No. no the index they, is they, they may do some volume weighting them, themselves, but I'm not waiting further. I'm just taking, I've got three mm -hmm. indexes, I just okay. average them. And I do some quantization, so I'm not reporting cents. You know, I, I quantize according to the uh, the NASDAQ rules of, of tick size compared to price. Clark, what, what, what was this? What block time do you assume to get to the halving date? I'm running forward the uh, prior year, this guy. Got it. Um, so when you're really far out, maybe that's not, it may be like I should, I should average the number of blocks back from the halving and like project that forward. So when we get really close, this number starts to maybe not be as responsive, but when we're really far away. Maybe it's too, maybe it's too responsive. So. I don't know. It, that's why. That's why I put this module in to show a big range of possibilities. So, like, hey, anytime between January and September is when the having is going to be. You know, I'm not quite sure at this point. Steve, you had a question. Yeah, I was just curious. Like, what sort of technology is this built in? What sort of it's a node. Tools? No JS. Okay. No JS. Right. Yeah. The whole thing, like even the back end parts. Yeah, the back end is Node. The front end is just uh, kind of hand rolled JavaScript. So it's pretty lightweight. I'm not using any big frameworks or anything. Um, no React. Does can you really see the Bitcoin uh, the number of Bitcoin Tor nodes? Can you see the number of Tor nodes? So Bit nodes reports the listening addresses of the nodes that it finds, and and if there, if it's an onion, I count that as a Tor node. Um, if you're looking at your log of your Bitcoin node, if you look at your log, you can see the address you connected to, and so you can uh, find a list of, of Tor nodes that way as well. If you're running your your node on Tor. Okay. I'm curious, like, how much does it cost to run all this? Because Based on your data, it sounds like a lot of updates and you're hosting a ton of data and you're running a lot of averages. One, uh, one DigitalOcean server for, uh, for the website. I don't have a ton of users, um, so the bandwidth isn't really high, but it's, it's not that much data. I mean, once you've processed uh, some of the databases that I've got are probably less than 500 megs total. Wow. For the derived for the derived data. I did not expect that. Yeah, it's not now. I'm not I'm not storing time series of all these things. So it's oh, okay. a moment in time. Oh, and okay. it's gone. The dashboard is a snapshot. It's it's a, it's ephemeral. People are like, put a chart, put a chart. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna put yeah, a chart. Yeah, put a chart. Let me download some CSVs, man. Nope. So does that server then run all of the like the lightning node and the Bitcoin D node and everything too? I'm running those elsewhere and uh, pumping the data in. Okay, makes sense. It's been really fun running this. I really love the community response. Um, I built it. I built it for me, and then other people, other people liked it. So that's kind of the best. You're not forcing anything that way, right? Yeah, 
Um, you've mentioned that you also uh, drive the price free feeds from FPX. Like, does that cost any money, or is that is their APIs free? All the APIs are free. Got it. For now, and I think they probably will stay free for a while because of competition. Mm. Uh, if one exchange started locking down their data, then the bot, the people making bots, would be like, "I'll just." Why would I pay you for your data? I'll just go to a different exchange. So, when are you going to add a a, a Brithit dance uh, video uh, box? A dance video box? Soon. But that's memes in Bitcoin. That might inc increase your bandwidth requirements. <laughs> I'll just yeah, you, YouTube. You put it on YouTube, so they're they're paying for the bandwidth. I have a, I have a question. Um, in the money supply, how how is there three hundred and eighty seven point nine BTC? If if the block subsidy has always been an, a round number, that's a great question. So mine is actually wrong, like I said, but uh, so first of all, the consensus rules say that you can only claim up to the subsidy amount. So less than or equal to 6.25. So a few blocks have claimed less. Oh, wow. Okay. And then uh, there was bit 30, where a couple min a minor mined identical blocks, um, sorry, the Coinbase transactions within two blocks <clears throat> had the exact same hash because they just were they were sending to the same address, mining to the same address over and over again. And that that precipitated committing to the block height in the Coinbase uh, Coinbase transaction data. But it's a factor. If you can mine a transaction with the same hash as another transaction, you can like shadow it in the chain. And the first one wins, I think. The first one to get spent wins. So you could essentially take away someone's coins. So Two blocks early on uh, need to be written out of the history. That's 100 coins. And then about 1,100 other blocks, uh, the, the, the amount that you give yourself in the Coinbase transaction must equal to or less than the subsidy plus the fees. A lot of blocks didn't claim the fees. So those fees or the subsidy, whichever way you look at it, those coins are lost. So there's these leakages of 50,000 sats, whatever, a bunch of times. And that accounts for another 10, 12, 13 Bitcoin. Wow. Also, there are some op return outputs that have value associated with them. So you, some, some transactions commit value to a null data output op return which, and those, those are unspendable outputs. So between op return, I think it's like three coins, uh, unclaimed fees is like 10, 12 coins. And then, um, yeah, this number is a little high by about 110. I need to fix it. I was working on fixing it. It's a big, it's a big undertaking, but the, you know, it's a lot harder to do that computation correctly than to just scan the chain, uh, the easy way. At the next drunk Bitcoin, whatever, that should be the question. Who can name the four reasons that, you know, that the Bitcoin isn't or isn't or the total Bitcoin supply isn't around? Them? They'll teach it. They'll teach it to uh, kindergartners in the citadels. <laughs> There'll be like a little placard on the wall with like border on it in like you know, the kindergarten classroom. You know, one of our members actually had a question about crypto watch. Mm -hmm. uh, Damien, was there, what did you want to know about a uh, crypto watch? Oh, I've just never used it. I haven't heard about it. So I was just, I was just wondering what it was. Actually, yeah, I, I am I'm kind of interested too, because I know it was crypto watch was his like own thing. And then um, I think like Kraken acquired it. And so what's the relationship between crypto watch and Kraken? Crypto watch is a wholly owned subsidiary of Kraken. Um, it's a 
market watching website. You can mark, you can watch, you know, whatever markets you want. Lots and lots and lots of markets. Um, and they have cool charts and lots of, you know, lots of real time data. You can trade through the site and collapse these, you know, real time visual books, real time order book. Um, and then chart with your, your technical indicators and things like that. Um, so what I've been working on is CryptoWatch desktop, which is desktop software that you, you know, like download and install on your machine. Um, and it's written in Rust and it's lightning fast and you can have custom layouts. You get like 16 charts on the screen, instant response time. It's, we're, we're really kind of, Browsers are really like ruining people's expectations of software mm. nowadays. Uh, when you run, what sort when of, you run what fast sort of desktops are you use? Hmm? I'm just, I'm, I'm interested in Rust. I was wondering what kind of UI library could you use with, with a Rust desktop app? Yeah, we're using a really library called Ice. Um, Ice, okay. ICED, and we are sponsoring the development of, of that library. And we're building our, our, hmm. uh, Graphical program on top of it, and it's it's amazing. It's lightning fast. Um, oh. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I can't wait to see that. That's the Learn cool. Rust. And you know, it's cross -platform. Cross -platform. The cross platform yeah. we deploy Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, if you really try hard, you could shim it into mobile platforms as well. See what else? The, the to-do list is still a mile long. Uh, uh, there's a lot of a lot of other things I'd like to do, but at some point you start running out of screen space. Yeah. Um, on mobile, it's the dashboard's really nice on mobile because all these collapse into just one big scrollable column. Um, there's probably needs to be a UI update at some point to be able to hide and show modules you're you're not interested in, but you know. Soon, right? Um, I have a question. I hear a lot of criticism about uh, about um, fee estimate or uh, like estimation software. Mm -hmm. like how how robust do you think your fee estimator is? I'm just passing through the estimator from Bitcoin Core. So I'm asking Bitcoin Core, two blocks, six blocks, 144 blocks, and a uh, thousand eight blocks. I'm just passing those estimates straight through to the user here. Um, Bitcoin Core's estimates seem to be maybe a little laggy, uh, but it depends on who you're getting your estimate from. I mean, a lot of companies we saw during the block size wars, a lot of companies predicate their business model on fast transaction times. Yeah. And that's uh, an abuse of a settlement network. And so they're going to estimate really massive fees so they can, they can offload the fees on their users to keep their support tickets queue small. And they tried to take over the network to fork in a higher block size to facilitate their business models and the network rejected their proposal. Uh, so hopefully we don't see that again for some time. Um, so you asked that you have to ask who is who's making the estimate for you, right? And then look at something like this. And, and pay, again, patience always seems to pay off in three sats per byte. Um, we had that massive fee spike a couple weeks ago, and this day number, I think, got up to like 10 or 15 sats per byte, which was the highest I, I've seen it. Um, the week number might have gone up to two. But if you're patient, you know, Bitcoin is a settlement network. Um, so it's like final settlement. And so you just think of it that way and you won't be disappointed. All right, do we have any other questions? Well, Clark, thank you so much for presenting on your dashboard. Um, I personally found it really fascinating. I really liked your module on money economics, especially the uh, daily pen hash uh, per second value. That's something I haven't seen before. In, um, Probably will toot about it tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, my pleasure.